Well, you guys sound awesome this morning. Let's just get right into it. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Hope we're excited for a Bible study here this morning. Hope we're excited again to the Word of God. Give me an amen once you're there in Ephesians 3. All right, we still, we still, we still waiting over here. I'm going to give you some time. J- Jason's there, though. He's, he's, he's quick with it. But we got to wait for someone else. <laughs> All right. All right, Trey's there. That's uh, good enough for me there. So. Ephesians 3, verse 1. The Bible says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. If you didn't know, if you're not a Jew, then you're a Gentile. Amen. Make sure we're all clear on that. Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I've already written briefly. In reading this, then you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the ministration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, to the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Pretty awesome passage we just read right there. The year is 62 AD, and Paul is indeed in a jail in Rome, and the Holy Spirit inspires him to write to the church in Ephesus that he plants in Acts chapter 19. The main point of the passage we just read, I believe, is this mystery of Christ. Now, quite interesting, that word mystery is used a lot in the epistles, where he talks about the mystery of the resurrection, that's in 1 Corinthians 15, the mystery of hardening of Israel, that's in Romans chapter 11, and even the mystery of lawlessness, that's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But the context of this mystery is the mystery of Christ. And you got to know the Bible because the Bible is crystal clear. Ephesians 3, verse 6, we just read, says the mystery of Christ refers to how the Gentiles, meaning non-Jewish people, can now be in one body with Israel. That they can be one family together. And this was something that the first century church, who they were Jews and converted to Christians, struggled with. When they, when they heard Jesus say, go to all nations by making disciples, they thought that God wanted them to get all the exiled Jews from all around the world and they could become Christians. But no. What Jesus meant when he said all nations, he meant all nations. And that's the mystery of Christ. He wanted Jews. He wanted Gentiles, he wanted whites, he wanted blacks, he wanted Latinos, he wanted all nations. It's awesome that around here we see all nations in this church this morning. The mystery of Christ is no mystery anymore. Just look around and see all the different nations from all around the world. What was so fascinating about this mystery, it just wasn't foreign to the people of the the Jewish people right there. It was also foreign to those in the heavenly realms. 
where they didn't understand that the church was to present the manifold wisdom of God. In reality, the finalization of his creation. Which gives us more insight on Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 10. The Lord's Prayer. It says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's in heaven? A family. A perfect family. A family that every day, every hour, every second are saying glory, glory, glory to the Lord God Almighty. That's what's happening in heaven. But God wants to see the same thing here on earth. Where the Bible says in the book of Titus that God wants a people eager to do what is good eager to share their faith, eager to blow off their missions, eager to love one another, eager to evangelize the nations in this generation. And we're here to build that family so that we could see one day a family here on earth and a family in heaven. We want to have a family till the end. And that's the title of my lesson here this morning, Family Till the End. I hope you guys are excited again to the Word. So far we had a pretty awesome service. Uh, the welcome was electric by Matthew and Selma right there. Uh, what a communion by Esteban Garcia. Let's get up for Esteban one more time. And you just got to love the cursors doing contribution. Uh, it's, it's always awesome, convicting, and inspiring. Let's give it up for the Kirshes one more time. You know, I, I'm a bit of an old soul. Even though I'm, you know, I'm 27 years old. Some of the campus, the campus guys think I'm older, but just 27. You know, we have some who are older than me in the campus, but amen. Uh, like, you didn't know, Mike Hall's older than me, so. Uh, <laughs> but I, I used to love watching old sitcoms. You guys with me, right? I used to love watching sitcoms like Different Strokes. Anyone watch that? I used to love watching The Brady Bunch. Uh, even Leave It a Beaver. <laughs> family Ties. So I, I thought today for, we're going to talk about family. I thought we could take our four points. We have four points today, so strap on in. <laughs> our four points from different sitcom titles. My first point is All in the Family. My second point is, family matters. My third point is, family feuds. And my final point is, full house, amen? Let's talk about my first point here, all in the fam. Let's go to Ephesians chapter two. If you didn't know, All in the Family was a sitcom in 1971. Archie Bunker, Edith. Anyone know what I'm talking about here, all the family? I know Paul knows. Great show. Fenton's know too, it's great. If you haven't watched it, you watch it. It's considered one of the greatest sitcoms of all time. But let's see what the Bible talks about in terms of all in the family. Ephesians 2 in verse 1. The Bible says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Yikes. In which you used to live when you follow the ways of this world and of the ruler, the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now working those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. What an amazing insight that the Bible teaches us here on the reality of what's happening outside of these doors. And also the reality for every single person before they became a Christian. The Bible says that you were alive, but dead in your transgressions. That yes, your body was alive, but your soul was dead. 
in a real way, it was like a living zombie apocalypse. We're, we're alive, but we're just gratifying the cravings of our flesh. God wanted people eager to do what's good. We were eager to do what was wrong. Eager to do sin, eager to do that, eager to do this. But then there must be a shift at some point. So contrary to popular belief, not everyone is a child of God. Now we are all God's creation, but not everyone is a son or daughter of God. Even in John chapter 8, verse 42, Jesus tells to a couple of Pharisees, if God were your father, you would love me for I've come here from God. He goes on to say, you belong to your father, the devil. And that's the reality of what's going on outside of these doors and what's going on before we became Christians. Our father was not Jesus. Our father was not God. The ruler of this era is indeed Satan. And he's leading the whole world astray. And his major vices, yes, there may be sin, yes, there may be drugs, sex, alcohol, but it's also false religion. Yeah. It's, it's leading those astray who want to be a true child of God. So you just gotta love the Bible here. It just lays it on out. Two options. You're gonna be a child of God or a child of Satan. And you must choose this morning. But you came to church here this morning. So I, I, I'm guessing you want to be a child of God right there. Well, how do we become children of God when that scripture in John 8 says, if you love me, God will be your father. John, who was the author of the gospel of John, also writes three other epistles. First John, second, and third. In first John 5, he says, if the love of God is in you, you will obey his commands. So what does it really mean to love God? It does not mean coming to a church on a Sunday morning lip service. It does not mean just sacrificing and doing something so that you can make yourself feel better about yourself. True love for God is this, is to obey his commands, and that's what we'll know. We will be all in the family. And what's his command? It says in Matthew 28 that he wants all nations to become disciples of Jesus. And if you look in the Bible, the word disciple and Christian are the same thing. And those men who were disciples, those women who were disciples, they were radical men and radical women for God. They had true faith that led to repentance. And then he said, when you make a disciple, you baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in Ephesians 2, verse 19 and 21, that when you become a baptized disciple, consequently now you become a child of God. You become God's son, God's daughter, and we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. So in a lot of ways, what happens, we have a blood transfusion. That no longer there's the blood in our souls of humans. Now we have the blood of Jesus Christ running through our veins. And because of that, if you're a baptized disciple, we become brothers. We become sisters. Hey, you didn't choose me. Hey, I didn't choose you. But it doesn't matter. We're all in the family for Jesus Christ. Because we know when someone gets baptized, in Galatians 3, verse 26 to 27, it says, now you become a child of God. And it's amazing to see all those who recently made a decision to become children of God. Uh, it's so awesome to see here all around LA, but even just here in the Metro Coast, to see those who've gotten baptized and quickly become family. You know, I was encouraged where I camp as Devo this Friday night, and uh, Jacob Beebe uh, preached an awesome sermon for the Lord. Well, we had a good news sharing before we started the, the devotional, and uh, the UCLA sister Rochelle shared some good news. And she, she lifted up Laura. And I was in passing because she was like, man, we've been through a lot. But I was like, you guys just been here for a couple months. 
But, but it shows that the UCA Lamb sisters, they are family in the Lord. You know, I think of those who got baptized in Southland. I, I think of Bryce. Uh, I, think of, I think of B Money. Bryce literally gave up everything. Just got out from his house in St. Louis Obispo, gave up all that comfort, drove down to being the brother's house. And that meant he is family in the Lord. I, I, I got to think of, of Trey Baker. Uh, Trey, Trey, like, this is the thing. He has, he has his own dorm, but he never sleeps there. He's, he, he's always at the brother's household. Why? Because it's the family of God. It's so awesome to see young disciples be all in the family. But, you know, it's been very exciting this past week to really have the honor to study the Bible with uh, Peyton and Trey over there. And it's been so encouraging studying with them, too, because they quickly became family. Uh, Peyton and Trey, they both, they both serve as football coaches on the USC football team. And as we're studying the Bible with them, they just, they just know they, 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 they had a, a, a yearning right there to want to be disciples of Jesus. And it was awesome. Like this past week, I mean, even on Friday with Peyton, we did like three Bible studies. Uh, we were over there at Jason's house doing a Bible study. Then we went back to USC, did a Bible study. Then we went to devotional. He's just fired up the whole time. And today, Peyton's going to become our brother in Christ by being baptized in the blood of Jesus. I, I, want, I want to encourage, inspire, and challenge you if you are a guest here this morning. Follow the footsteps of these men and women. Make a decision to be all in the family. Make a decision to allow God to adopt you by you making a decision to study the Bible, love his commands, obey his commands, so you too could be all in the family. Amen? All right, now we, have a, we know what it means to be all in the family. Now we got to do point number two, have a deep conviction that family matters. Let's go to Matthew 25. You know, you got to love Urkel and win the Winslows. I, well, I was Steve Urkel for Halloween one time. Because I can relate to him. It's okay, it's okay to be a nerd. Uh, Matthew 25, verse 31, family matters. Let's see, how much does family matter to God? We see a... A parable that starts off in verse 31. Indeed, the parable of the sheep and the goats. Let's read it. You guys there? All right. It says verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on the glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Let's stop right there. It's interesting. Look at a sheep and a goat. It's kind of hard to tell the difference, even when you look at them just from the naked eye. Well, goats have horns. Sheep do not. But I learned something from our brother Matt here, uh, brother Matt Rodriguez. He told me that, I, you know, whenever you learn something from someone, you got to make sure you go fact check it. And uh, I, went to, I went to go and fact check, and he was totally right. The difference between... <laughs> I trust Matt, but you know, he's, you know, you're going to preach it. You got to make sure it's sound doctrine. A goat is self-reliant. A goat doesn't listen to the owner's voice. A goat thinks it knows best. A sheep, on the other hand, relies on its shepherds, knows their shepherd's voice, and they know they're stupid little animals that need some guidance. The Bible says stupid, so you can say stupid. Now, you got to ask yourself this morning, are you right now a sheep or are you a goat? Good thing you still have time to repent if you feel like you're a goat because you still become a sheep. Let's continue going in verse 34. Thank you, Matt, for that insight, amen. amen. Verse 34, the Bible says, 
Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared before you since the creation of the world. Remember, that's our mystery of Christ, the kingdom. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous man said, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to eat? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he'll say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also asked, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger and needing clothes, or, or sick or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they'll go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Wow. What, what, what a sobering passage. Two different groups. You have the sheep and the goat. Both of them are surprised. One does not help, help God's people. One does. And they both ask, when the righteous say, well, God, but when, I've never even seen you before. It's my first time seeing you in heaven. When did I give you something to eat? When did I give you something to drink? And you're like, yeah, you'd be like, remember that time when you gave that brother, maybe, maybe it, was a, it was a Esteban? You gave him some food? Maybe, 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 hopefully something healthy right there? Some, some broccoli, chicken, and rice? When you gave him that food, I ate some of that. You also gave me some of that. And I was like, wait, 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 when did we invite you in? Remember when that brother came from Mexico or Brazil and you invited him into your house? Yeah, that, that was for me too. And they're like, wow, we helped Jesus. Because in reality, God has everything. How can we help God? We help him by helping his children, which are disciples of Jesus. And the others, who consider themselves a part of the family, but didn't really think family mattered. And they were in the church, and they saw people who needed help, saw a gap they could fill, but didn't fill it. And God said, remember that time when you could have helped that brother when he was down? When you could have stepped up in that moment? When you could have been a leader in that moment? That was the moment where you could have done it for me. And family didn't matter to you that much. From this passage, we could have a sound teaching. Whether or not we make the church our family is indeed a salvation issue. That we're not just here as fans. We're not just here as reporters. We're not just here just to sit and fill a seat. This is really actually our family. That I just know, hey, I have like a little Puerto Rican uh, brother named Matthew Rodriguez. That's my actual brother. That's my actual brother in Christ. I, it's awesome to have big white brothers like Caden. Okay, yeah, he's huge. It's awesome. But I don't see that's not just my, my church brother or my church guy. Go, that's my real brother in Christ. Whether or not we make the church our family is going to depend on whether or not we're going to see God in heaven. How much of a conviction that should put in our hearts to see this church as our family. 1 John 2 verse 19 says, They went from us, but they did not really belong to us. For they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. I believe something that's so solidifying when someone gets baptized 
is whether or not they're going to see the church as their family. Yeah. It solidifies you. Yeah. If you really see God as your father and the people and next to you as your brother, sister, mom, and dad, it's awesome to have grandparents and the people have the Kirshners. It's awesome to have the Hammonds. I mean, they're, they're, uh, he told me, like, hey, you're the same age as my oldest son. I was like, amen. That's, it's awesome to have some fathers in the faith. It's awesome to have Jason and Sarah. Like, we got to see it as family. This is not just some church we're going to. This is truly the mystery of Christ, the family of God. And it's amazing. It says how they know their family is that they were giving back. They served. You see, giving, contribution, missions, really exposes where our hearts are at. It's not just us giving some money. It's giving to God, but also taking care of God's people locally and all around the world. Now, if we don't have a deep conviction about giving back to God and helping God's people, that is going to be a salvation issue for us. And, and I just got to be honest, just straight from the pulpit. I am concerned for some of us here this morning. I'm concerned because some of us just don't have a deep conviction on tithing, on giving, and giving missions. No, we understand there's some, that we, have, we have some financial issues, amen, we'll help you. But for to, to have the means to give or to not trust God in your contribution, I'm concerned for you. Because it shows you don't really see this church as your family. Like if, you're, if you had a family that was sick with cancer and they say you have to raise up $1,250 in one month, do you think you'll be able to find the money to do it? And the way we have to see it, we have, fam- we have lost family all around the world, sick with cancer. They have the cancer of sin. And we're waiting for us to give so we can see more sold out disciples all around the world. Family matters. Let's make sure we're giving back to God. There's an old story of an old bishop in Tours, France called Martin. And the legend goes, one cold winter, he was entering a city, and a beggar asked for money and food from him. Martin had nothing to give him, but the beggar was blue with cold, was blue and cold, and Martin took off his old, battered soldier's cloak he wore, cut into two, and gave half to the beggar. And he blessed him and and left. That night, Martin had a dream. In it, he saw heaven and all the hosts of heaven and Jesus in the heavenly places. And Jesus was wearing the half of a Roman soldier's cloak. One of the angels came to him and said, Master, why are you wearing that old cloak? And Jesus answered, my servant Martin gave it to me. That's what we're doing. Every time we give to God, every time we go share our faith, every time we're helping the family, we give them the opportunity to clothe themselves with Christ, to get that cloak. And Jesus said, you didn't just do it for them. You did it for me because you helped my children. You know, I really got to lift up my mom and dad in the faith, Jason and Sarah Dimitri. Um, you know, as, as I preached before, and as Stevan even alluded to, my father did pass in 2018. And it was an incredibly tough time for me because I was very close to my father. He, he, was, he raised me. He taught me great principles, taught me how to work hard. And him going, especially knowing that he never became a disciple, was so challenging. But I remember one of the first people to call me was Jason. He, he called me. And we shed tears together before. And then at my father's funeral, the disciples were there with me. And Jason was there right next to me. And help me realize something. Mark 10 is true. You give up everything, God give you 100 times more. And although my earthly father was gone, I still have my father in heaven, but I got a spiritual father in Jason. And help me have a conviction even more that family does 
matter. I do want to challenge us here this morning. We got to just have a deep conviction. We're fighting for our family. We don't have to be here next year. We don't have to be here next week. We don't have to be here in 10 years. We're fighting for Camille, the baby of the Colomores. So you can one day have a church to go to. We're fighting for Mickey and Monty. So they one day have a kingdom they could go to, be in a church that's deep convictions, be in a church that's true, being in a church that really loves God, being in a church that is the true family of God. That's what we're fighting for. And I hope today you have a deeper conviction than that. Now here's the thing, it's awesome to be family. But the family will hurt you. <laughs> Point number three, family feud. Let's go to Luke 15. I know all of us have seen Family Feud before. You know, I watched it when Louis Anderson was the host. Anyone remember that guy? Now we got Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey's hilarious. <laughs> Glorious mustache, that's true. Every night my mom and my brother would watch Family Feud when I was at home. And we always, we always you know, try to see who will win. So everything's a competition in my house. <laughs> Luke 15 and verse 11. Let's look at the parable of the two lost sons. Our third point is family feud. Verse 11, the Bible says, Jesus continued, there was, Jesus continued, there's a young man who had two sons. The younger one who said to, said to his father, Father, give me my share of this estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and three, and there squandered, to stop it, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I'm starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father's psalm was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. We're familiar with this passage. A man who was a son of God, in our vernacular, a, a baptized disciple in the kingdom, in the fellowship, decided to fall away, left the kingdom, said, you know what, I want my inheritance, basically saying, dad, you're dead to me. Goes out, squanders it. And then he just come back to his senses. It's just horrible in the world. We can't forget that as Christians. It's, it's, the Bible says when we fall away, it's like going back to our vomit. And then eating. Have you ever seen a dog do that before? That's what the Bible says that a disciple looks like when they make a decision to go back to their sin. But he comes back to his sin like, what am I doing with the pigs here? And then while he's still a long way off, God has open arms for him. And says, come back, my child. Come back, my son. He says, give him the best robe. Put a ring on it. And then let's get some ribeye steaks. <laughs> That's my favorite steak right there, ribeye steak. He had a nice little fat, instead of fat and calf, so I had a nice little fat strip there, you know? <laughs> oh, we're not too hungry for lunch right here, man. And it's awesome. And it's always amazing to see when someone who walks away from God makes a decision to come back to God. 
You know, this past week, I got an opportunity to be in a restoration study with our, 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 our brother Jesse over there. And Jesse was baptized in 2011 and fell away in 2021. But he made a decision that he came back to his senses. And I believe very soon, Jesse is going to be our restored brother in Christ. Amen. And it's awesome. I'd be all cheered right here. It's amazing to see when someone comes back. But let's see the reaction of another brother in the fold. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the oldest son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what's, what's, what's going on? Your brother has come back, he replied, and your father has killed a fat calf because he has, has him back safe and sound. The older brother be, became angry and refused to go in. So the father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered the father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me even a goat. So I should celebrate with my friends. But when this son, when this son of yours who has squandered your property who prostitutes, comes, to prost comes home, and you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So now we see the reaction of the older brother here, who you would think he would have been fired up to see his fallen brother come back. But he gets focused on what he did not have and what he had instead of seeing a restored brother come back to the kingdom. Wow. He was there longer. And he's angry at God and gets bitter and says, where's my goat? Where's my sheep? Where's my reward? Where's my boyfriend? Where's my girlfriend? Where's my ministry? Where's my celebration? Why are you blessing him or her and not me? And... This is the parable of the two lost sons, because this wasn't one son who was lost. It was this son who was even in the kingdom, yeah. even yeah. in the church. Yeah. The guy fell asleep wow. and started to feud with God and his brothers. Wow. You know, in Galatians 6 verse 4, in the easy to read version, we have an easy to read version now, it says, don't compare yourself with others. Just look at your own work to see if you've done anything to be proud of. You must each accept the responsibilities that are yours. You see, God has a plan for you. He has a race for you. He has trials and tribulations for you. He has delays for you. He has a story for you. But when we get focused on comparing ourselves to others, why am I here? Why am I not there? We become like this lost son. And we become bitter and we fall asleep. And we lose that conviction that, wow, it's great to be all in the family. Wow, family matters. And I just gotta be honest with you. I think there's some who are amongst us who have fallen asleep spiritually. Yeah. And, and now more than ever, we need you as a family to wake up. We're, we're losing blood here. We're losing the Hammonds. We're losing Lisa. We need people to raise on up in the Lord to be on the family once again, to have a deep conviction that family matters, stop feuding with God and make a decision to repent and be like that lost son. You know, I, I remember when uh, Regina and I started dating. You know, it was awesome. It was uh, incredibly one-sided. Regina was uh, crazy for me and this, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was totally the initiator. I was totally crazy for it. It, it was totally on me, for sure. It was 2020, the pandemic. Uh, I was fresh off a breakup in the kingdom. Uh, I gained a lot of weight. Got fat. I had a very uneven afro that was nappy all the time. It was just a tough time in the Lord. I looked pathetic. Barbers went open. And I didn't trust my roommates. And I was just sad. I wouldn't admit it, you know. I was like, man, can, can I find that special person? Maybe, maybe, I'll be, maybe it's going to take me a little longer. I don't, I don't know. And, you know, I was always that kid that, you know, when I will do something, I always wanted to be good at it. But if I wasn't good, I will just quit. 
And, and I'll do it all the time when I play basketball with my, my big brother. He would just like destroy me all the time. He's just, because you're so much bigger than me at some point. But then I caught up and I started beating him. Uh, but whenever you beat me, I'll just be like, man, I don't, I don't even want to play anymore. And that's kind of how I did with this particular area of my life. I was like, you know what, maybe I'm just going to be like Paul here and, and be single for the Lord for the you know, I was looking at my peers, and some were dating, some were about to get engaged, some were married and leading churches, and I was like, man, where, where's my go? And, and I remember one night, you know, I had got a nice rebuke from another father of the faith, Fernando Chavez. Long story short, in a D group in front of my peers, he called me an emo child. And something just just like, like, dude, you kind of flare up a bit. You know, there's, there's one time where, there's a couple times where I flare up my just, I flared up here. But, you know, you got to be a good Christian. You got to be diplomatic. Like, bro, thank you, bro. <laughs> thank you, bro. I, I really needed that. But I was like, how dare you say that? She's <laughs> just so angry. But then I went to go and pray, amen. And I was like, you know, he's totally right. I got to repent here. It was during the pandemic, though, so I was like, man, I looked on Facebook. And <laughs> I know some of you guys have done that, too, amen. And I see Regine's picture. I was like, wow, she's really pretty. How is she single? And, you know, I just square my feet and shoot my righteous shot there. <laughs> I, I, you know, I was like, hey, you want, you want to go on a date? And it's going to be awesome. We go on a virtual date. And I knew from right away I wanted to marry this girl. But I was like, I'm, this, this, I'm suspicious here. I, I think she's, she's, she, she's, she's too awesome and not to be single. Little did I know, that month, someone's about to, supposed to fly out there and ask her to be her, his girlfriend. But the pandemic stopped it. So. It was like a, a, a and it's, we're righteous. It was like a righteous interception that the, that the Lord allowed to happen. Long story short, we started building, we started dating in September, and then last year, April second, twenty twenty two, we got married in Christ. Now I can confidently say I see all the delays, all the disappointments, all the setbacks were just from God. He's setting me up for a comeback. He's setting me up for a story. He's setting me up for something that I can look back and say, you know what? I trusted God in that moment. And the Bible says he will give you the desires of your heart. I really want to challenge us. If you've become like that previous son who's looking at the world and wants to go back, don't go back to the mud. Don't go back to the sin. Don't go back to the vomit. But even if you're like the older son, we're like, man, why is that brother raising up? Why, why is that sister? We have to have a conviction that God has a perfect story for you as well. Yeah. You're a child of God as well. Yeah. You're, you are his son. You are his daughter. Make a decision. Don't feud with the Lord. Don't feud with God's people. And let's make a decision to live in unity. Amen. <laughs> all right. Now we're all in the family. Now we understand family matters, and we stop feuding with the Lord and his people, we could do our final, very short point, full house. For the sake of time here, we're not going to turn there, but Luke 14, verse 15 and 24. It's the parable of the great banquet, where God sends servants after servants to invite them to his awesome feast, to invite them to this amazing thing. But one person after another person after another person, they all have excuses. Finally, he says, you know what? Just, just compel them to come in. Get those who maybe are, are not seen as the, the, the wise of the brightest in society. And I know they will come in. And then they see slowly but surely the banquet starts to fill up. But then we read in Luke 14, verse 22. The Bible says, just follow along with me. The sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. 
See, God desires a full house. And right now, it's awesome. We've been meeting here this year. And it's, it's amazing, even just looking out right now, the seats are starting to fill up. And I want to put it before you that next year, we shouldn't even be here. God doesn't want a little house. God doesn't want small victories. We serve a God that loves to show off. We serve a God of big things, not small things. We serve a God that does not want the house to be a fraction full. He wants a full house for the Lord. And it's amazing. He just wants a full house not just here in Los Angeles. He wants a full house all around the world. And this is why the Hammonds and Lisa are going to Dallas and Judy French. Why is that? Because they have a conviction that they're going there to fill the house of God in Dallas. But like I said earlier, we're going to miss them dearly. I've learned so much from Paul in such a small, short of time. Um, I, I, love, I just love going to Paul's house. He, he has all the old articles from the former movement. And I just love looking. I, I love the history. And he, see, he just keeps seeing the thousands. Of, like, like, we're, we're fired up to go to the GLCC 5,000. They had 10,000 disciples in Los Angeles. And I appreciate his heart and Kim's heart saying, you know, we're going to give up everything. Judy's heart, Lisa's heart, we're going to go back to Dallas. We're going to go to Dallas, and we're going to fill the house over there. God wants to fill a house in, over here in L.A., in Dallas, and all around the world. And one day, there will be that, that, that final baptism. And can you imagine that one day when that person says, Jesus is Lord, and they get baptized into Christ. And then the heavens open, and God says, my house is finally full. And what is bound here on earth will then go up there in heaven. That's what we're fighting for. We're fighting for not just a full house here in Los Angeles, not a full house here around the world. We're fighting for a full house in heaven. And it's amazing to see what God has done so far. It's amazing to see what God has done through Jason Sarah in such a short time here in L.A., I mean, after this week, 190 baptized into Christ and 32 restorations so far in just five months. And so far in the Metro Coast, it's been awesome. You guys have been working hard for the Lord. In 18 weeks in the Metro Coast, we have seen 38 additions for the Lord. 32 baptisms, four restorations, and two place memberships. But I, I want to inspire you. Yeah. I want to encourage you here. And I want to challenge you. There is still room in the house. Yeah. We're just in May, guys. We have a lot more work to do in 2023. The year of miracles. Yeah. And I really want to challenge each and every Bible talk leader and your Bible talk. If you don't know what a Bible talk is, if you're a guest, there's a small groups that we have that are focused on evangelism. I want to challenge every single Bible talk to fill this summer with a summer campaign filled with love and family, but filled with staying focused on the mission. And I believe if every single Bible talk in our Metro Coast Super Region is fruitful once or twice a month, in May, June, and July, we can see 30 or 40 baptisms. Could you imagine 30 or 40 new sold out baptized disciples going into the fall semester? Wow, God can do it. And God wants to see a full house. Are you guys with me here? Let's make a decision not to take a break from being a Christian on summer break. Let's make a decision to give all we got so we can make sure that the Lord will be pleased. Let's close out in Revelation chapter 7. Revelation 7. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. One last verse, and we're done. So I want to close out with this vision. What a beautiful one it is. It says in verse 9, After this I looked, and there before was a great multitude that no one could count. 
from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory, and wisdom, and thanks, and honor, and power, and strength be to our God forever and ever. And the church said, Amen. One day, one day, we don't know when that day is going to come. It could be today. It could be after Peyton gets baptized. You can be in this glorious scene. Just think about this, guys. The scene. Being with all the saved people of all time. The mystery of Christ will be no mystery any longer. We'll be there saying glory, glory to our Father in heaven for eternity. Because we truly were family till the end. And to God be the glory. <laughs>